guys, let me think now. We, uh, I think we started arguing over the internet about Iber Cat, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but I, I say arguing because we, we agree on things and we disagree on things, and that's the way, that's fine. But Forrest and I got to know each other six months ago at the Electric Universe Conference, and I think we hit it off pretty well, and I've just enjoyed uh, meeting this brilliant man. He's got, by the way, in the back of the room, he brought some of his bishop cubes. These are his own invention, and they are to the Rubik, what Rubik's cube is to twisting and turning, the, the bishop cubes are to shifting and translation. So rotation versus translation. It's a really cool thing, uh, and he said he's going to donate a, a portion of uh, what he gets for those uh, to the NPA, so I thank him for that. And he's going to be talking today, I don't, oh, you're going to get that up for me, thank you. I don't he know. doesn't have a presentation. Oh, he does. And I don't remember the name of it, so, but I do know that it's about philosophy and having to do with, uh, this section is sort of looking at the big picture of things, and so of course he's going to be doing that without a presentation, um, talking, in, in which case it might make sense to have a, this light on, <laughs> or this one anyway, David. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the talk will be about uh, philosophy, not just in science, but in, in a broader context even than that, and the way uh, the way paradigms are established, maybe I'm saying too much, but I'll let Forrest talk about that. Forrest Bishop, come on up and talk. Somebody over to kind of check out what the what the tinfoil hats are up to over here in the pyramid. So I was wondering before I get started, um, would any uh, secret operatives please raise your hands? No. Okay. Oh, there you go. you're fired. <laughs> All right. The talk is on the science of censorship, and uh, the title is a reverse play on censorship and science, which I expect. Most people in this audience have run across now and then, all the time, everywhere you turn. And I've done some work in this, um, and as my colleague Ivor Cat, who was mentioned earlier, has for over 30 years. And I studied across a lot of different fields in law, medicine, history, economics, on and on. And in these different fields, I find similar phenomena. Ah, that's what a science is. It's not just anecdotes and you know a flying saucer landing here and there. It's a repeatable event, quantifiable to some extent. That's what makes a science. And so this phenomenon, which we call censorship, has these structures that we can elucidate and quantify to an extent and um, even go so far as to make predictions as to what will happen with a, if you make a particular input to the system, what, what will the output be? <clears throat> but before we do that, what Greg was saying about defining what, what is it we're talking about? <laughs> Because we all censor. I'm censoring right now, even as I'm speaking to you. I'm saying some things, I'm not saying other things. We all have to censor. We all have to filter the information coming in and be careful about what we say going out. It's, it's just natural, not just for humans, but for, for all creatures. We have to do that. So in my paper, I use the word illicit censorship, but I didn't really define that. And I don't really have a good definition for you. I'm not up here to present all the, all the tidy results of this study, because I don't have all the answers. But just draw sort of an outline of what I think can be done with the information we already have. And particularly in this age of the internet, it's become much easier to gather data. Go to a, a site like badastronomy.com or uh, randy.org or 
some of the uh, Darwinian evolutionary sites, um, the, the Keynesian economists do the same thing, and it's just a gold mine of information if you look at it objectively, which is very difficult to do. Just look at, look at the data, the, the things that people say, the reactions, the social dynamics, and the words they use, the linguistics of it is very important talk about that a little in the paper. <coughs> so, we have these new research tools as well for this proposed science of censorship. And the point of all of this, of course, with any sciences, of course, is to understand the natural world. After all, censorship is a natural phenomenon. So, what makes it illicit? I don't have a good, pat answer. When Ivor Cat had dinner with uh, Mei Chow, the uh, editor of Nature Physics uh, at High Table, which is a ceremonial dinner at Cambridge, he turned to her and asked her, do you think there's such a thing as censorship in science? And she sat there for a moment and thought about that. And her reply was, what is censorship? Now, Ivor's interpretation, and, and partly mine, is that she didn't have, a, didn't have a conception of censorship in science. It was, it was out of her view. But of course, that's the main thing she does as an editor. A different interpretation is that that's a very good question, really. And it, it needs to be defined, just what do we mean by that? Do, do we just allow everything into our, into our world or not? And, and, and if, if not, why not? And furthermore, who, who, who's the guardian of the gate? And who's the judge of the judge? Who's to determine that? And that's really why I can't give you a good answer because I'm not that guardian. I'm not that good. So here's a, here's a science in need of a definition of what the science is. So th there's a weakness in it. Nonetheless, uh, Ivor Cat and later myself and others do study the reactions and, and the um, conduct and comport and what have you of, of um, establishment figures of various descriptions um, in, in, in the sciences as well as in other fields. And again, look for the common elements. There's certain words they use. There's certain um, behaviors. Um, there's, a, there's a certain psychology behind it too, which, which is a little, not certain, but there's, there is a psychology of it. Because this, this topic of censorship really spans a lot of fields, not all of which I'm an expert in, in fact, none of them. Um, psychology and history and linguistics and economics and on and on and on. So it's sort of a Venn diagram of all these different areas that, that fall in, that fall into this, that have elements of censorship in them for different reasons. And again, sifting out what's, what is illicit and what is illicit in, in what they do. And I'm sure we can all cite many examples that are clearly illicit. It's kind of like pornography. You know it when you see it. <laughs> But you can't really define it exactly that clearly, what, what is illicit. Now, I think anyone in MBA would agree that the, uh, what's been special relativity being a, a century-long case study of censorship. There's thousands of papers uh, debunking that, that topic, none of which can be published in, in a mainstream journal. And yet, it, and yet it's, it's um, a, really, a really obvious um, case of, of a mainstream belief that's easily shown to be incorrect. So I would define that as a case of illicit censorship, where you're defending a belief that, that's, that's long since falsified. Now, belief in God hasn't been falsified. So censoring belief in God would be illicit censorship, because there's no way to falsify that belief in the first place. So you can't go around and tell people, you, you can't believe in God because I say so. And you can't publish on that. That's illicit. So we, we, can, we, can, we can narrow it down to a fuzzy border between what's, what's 
um, illicit censorship and what's just part of what we have to do as human beings to get through this world, which we all do. <clears throat> so there's two, there's also behaviors that can tell us when censorship is illicit. And there's two categories that I've, some others have identified and I've, I'll just put out there, of, of um, responses, of ling linguistic responses, which I call thought stoppers and triggers. A thought stopper is when you're talking about a subject and it goes, oh, that's, that's a crank theory. That's, a, that's, that's an example of a thought stopper word. Oh, he's a crackpot. Look no further, think no more. So that, those kinds of words crop off often in these internet forums and, and in print. But again, these forums are just, just a gold mine. So those, those kinds of words, conspiracy theory is another one. Tinfoil hat, I used that one at the top of the talk. Oh, tinfoil hat theory, he's crazy, don't pay attention to him. So the thought stopper is designed to create shunning which is the behavior that follows from it. Shunning, of course, which is, you know, read about that in the Bible, it's not, nothing new there. Don't pay attention to that man, he's crazy, you know, the village idiot, put him out. So the, thought, the, the purpose of the thought stopper is to you know, cease, cease discussion on that topic and shun anyone who does discuss it. And that, that shunning can, uh, goes all the way to um, uh, terminating their career, uh, natural accident to do whatever you know, putting that person out of the picture so that the group fantasy is maintained triggers I'll get into that in a minute back to group fantasy this is a Lloyd de Maus's term He's, he uh, has a book, uh, book called psychohistory among other books and a website psychohistory.com and his his thesis is that um, we all have, at different times and periods, different groups share their group fantasy. And the group fantasy can change, and it has names. Global warming is the name of a group fantasy. The United States of America is the name of a group fantasy. It doesn't actually exist, it's just something that we all agree to, 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 to uh, support, or not. We have a special relativity, I believe, the group fantasy because it's not grounded in reality. There's no there, there's no there there. So, um, so the, the maintenance of the group fantasy is 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 what people do to maintain their status in the herd. So that's one piece of it, of, of social dynamics, is one of the reasons for censorship. To maintain the group fantasy and keep the coherence of the herd, of of, of this. The social unit, I should say. Herd is a denigrating word. I really need to drop that from my vocabulary. <clears throat> I should mention, this has been the most difficult paper I've ever written. And I've written quite a number of papers on space repulsion, relativity, not relativity, but electrodynamics, and on and on and on. This one, I retracted this thing twice, much to the chagrin of our dear editor. <laughs> It's very difficult to do. So it became uh, something of an exploration of my own self. Why was it so difficult for me? Because I couldn't censor what I was talking about. So I had to censor what I was talking about in my paper about censorship. <laughs> it was very difficult because, uh, without sounding like a martyr, I've, I've been the, uh, the recipient of censorship, as I'm sure any number of people in this room have as well, of course. And that um, it's difficult to uh, establish this, you have to be almost a Christ-like objective scientist <laughs> to study this field without um, putting your own experience on it, your own bad experience into, into what you're talking about, which is subjective. Oh, poor me, this happened to me, that happened to me. Well, yeah, cry and you cry alone. That's not objective, that's not science. That's, that's your personal life story, and, and it's certainly valid. But it colors what you're talking about. And that's the problem I have with this paper. And, and I've gone back and reread all three pages of it 
and I don't even I don't even care for the tone of it still. It began. It was a much longer paper. I, I just barely got three pages out in time to get it get it to the editor after retracting it. It was a very much longer paper because it's a very large subject, and there's no way I'm going to cover everything I wanted to talk about either in that paper or in this talk. In fact, I'd like to even spend the last 10 minutes uh, when I get to that to ask other people's opinions <coughs> about all of this because I don't have all the answers. What, 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 what is the list of censorship? Maybe you have a good story of censorship, that kind of thing. So it's not necessarily a question and answer, but other people's viewpoints I'd really like to hear. <clears throat> so to continue, Myself and a colleague um, are writing a computer program. We've partially flow charted it to help quantify the dynamics and mechanics of censorship. And some of these things are almost like troubleshooting a test, uh, a circuit board where you have test points on it, and you put a probe on there, and you expect to see this much voltage come out of it. And these questions, which I call triggers, I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> are, are like that. They're, they're test point questions. And a would-be famous one is called the cat question. This is a question Ira Cat has been asking for 30 years. And he's gotten all kinds of responses from very high levels, Nobel laureates and so on and so forth. Very simple question to do with uh, electricity very innocuous sounding question, and they're unable to answer it. But in the process of not answering it, we have found the same phenomenon I'm talking about, these same types of behavior, very extreme in some cases, as far as the language, the defamation, the and not just that, the, um, the theories they come up with to in the process of trying to answer that question. And even so far as very high level people that apparently don't even understand the question, even though it's very simple. Very high level people, um, MIT professors, that appear to not even understand the question itself. So that's phenomenal. It's extreme behavior. And I think that's, that's one of the key indicia of illicit censorship, is you find this kind of extreme behavior, extreme results to your test questions. I have another one I came up with about 15 years ago when I was very heavily into monetary system, history, theory, economics, all of this. <clears throat> and that sounds really innocuous. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I thought it was at first, but it wasn't the qu the question was innocuous, but was it was the answers and the reactions to it that were extreme. And the question is very simple: What is the Federal Reserve? Seems like a pretty blase question. And oh my, the answers I've gotten to that are off the charts. Maybe not as extreme as a cat question, because I didn't really pursue it that far. And I had variations on it. I, 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 I went into a bank one time and asked that, and ended up getting escorted out of it under armed guard. I mean, that's an extreme reaction. I said, oh, um, I'd like to deposit some Federal Reserve notes in my account. Can you do that? Yeah. So that, that one, that whole case is interesting because it's, it's the belief that has to be ignored. It's the fact that has to be ignored in order for the monetary system to work, and therefore people put it out of their minds. Again, it's, it's to maintain the group fantasy that these little pieces of paper and money and they make the world go round. We all have to ignore certain things about them. Again, to maintain group coherence so that we'd all you know, give and receive our bills and, and expect to be paid and pay and everything. And, and so it, it, it has led to that kind of extreme reaction. Back in uh, electromagnetic theory and physics, the cat question is sort of like that for that field. 
in order to maintain the belief in Maxwell's equations and quantum mechanics and the particle model and all of this, it's necessary to not answer the cat question. And that's why I think we have these extreme reactions to it. I'll be talking a little more about that on my, uh, my other talk, which is more of a technical talk. So these trigger phrases, I call them, the cat question, what is the Federal Reserve? We've got 10 minutes. I'm just going to talk a few minutes more, and then I'd really like to hear other people's opinions on these. Another indicia. I, I didn't go into what I call states of enthrallment. I think we're always all in a state, some state of light trance at all times. You're, you're in trance right now. You're, you're in a room listening to a speaker. And in order to do that, you have to censor out everything else about the world. So it's, it's again, a natural and necessary part of, of how we operate. You know, we have an intentional spotlight that has to be focused in order for us to function. So that would be illicit, if that's a word, censorship. States of enthrallment. But here's another indicia of an illicit censorship and or state of enthrallment, is the answers I get often are accompanied by a temporary breakdown of the person's linguistic skills, bordering on word salad. And I mean high-level people, again, not stupid people by any stretch. Conduct a perfectly good conversation, and then you throw out a question like that, and I've seen it many enough times to say, hey, here's a quantifiable phenomenon. I've seen it enough times, well, they'll be, as soon as they hit that trigger phrase, Boom, it's like a Manchurian candidate for a moment. They, 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 they lose control partially. Their, their sentence structure becomes fragmented, bordering again on word salad, which it means words strung together without meaning. Uh, a lot of free associations of, of disparate subjects, like things are burbling up from, from their innermost, uh, again, I'm not a psychologist, so subconscious or whatever. So, so there, there's, there's a test, there's one of those test points when you, when you ask that question that, or that trigger phrase. Sometimes it can even be a single word. And, and you have this momentary lapse of um, rationality. And, and then they usually always recover, fortunately. And then they can come back online. And, I, and I, again, I'd be interested if anybody else has any stories like that. So I would like to take um, questions and comments if anyone has any. Here's one now. Well, no, I'm just coming up to tell people that if you could, just come up here. We'll have a, the open mic be here. <laughs> but while I'm here anyway, I'll go ahead and say a couple <laughs> questions. Uh, could be what is light or what is gravity? I, I think that's the sort of question that can easily get emotional responses. What do you think? Um, well, that, I, I, I don't know. I've never tried that one. Again, these, these, these things have to be tested out on. on um, academians, that, that, you know, the, the, the test questions need to be tested. Okay, yeah. I mean, you, you have to you have to fine tune your instrumentation. Sure. So I, I don't know if that's a good one or not. Yeah. Seems to me it's too broad. Okay. Yeah. Right. It, I mean, it, you, it, it's just so broad that. Okay, we have Jeff Cook. Yeah, just a quick question in your opinion. Um, when is the line crossed from, hey, I own this publication and I don't want these papers come in because it doesn't share my general view, to the point where there's some you know, political upheaval where people are being jailed for their writings. And these, there's num numerous cases in history of this. Mm -hmm. in, in, in your opinion, I mean, obviously both are, well, one is infringing on the rights of the person who wrote it. And one is not. In your opinion, where is the line crossed where the rights of the writer is being infringed upon by the censorship? Okay. In your opinion. In my opinion, a journal has every right in the world to not publish a paper. That's, that's their right. But they don't have the right to say that they, their peers are authoritative, are the authorities. In fact, in my paper, I even question whether those peers exist. How do we know? They're anonymous. So I think that's where they cross the line. So when they say, this journal, not naming any names like Nature or Physics or anything, this is the authoritative journal, the top journal, and everybody should, any, anybody who's been peer-reviewed is in this journal. Again, the, the, the blogs are a goldmine for, for the 
the peer review um, component of this. Uh, they, 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 they go through their, I, I won't call them logic, but their arguments about why peer review is so important. But they, I've never seen anything like what I put in my papers. Hey, wait a minute. How do we know those peers even exist? How do we know their peers? What are their names? And how do we subpoena them in case I wanted to <laughs> dispute that? Because peer review is hearsay. It would not stand up in court. It's your invisible friend said so. So that's where I think the journal step over the line. Sure, nature's a great journal X. Can publish anything they want, but don't go calling yourself the, the, the authority that, that everybody is citing. And, and it's not and it's not the journal's fault. You, again, it's 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 a group behavior. You can't blame drop everything on the editor or any one person. It's it's how our society is working at the moment. Functioning or dysfunctioning, however you want to call it. Yes, sir. This group, by nature, uh, is challenging a mainstream paradigm in many different subjects. And what would, in your look over the years at censorship and the inability for um, new ideas to emerge? What would you suggest as a course of action? Ah, thank you for that question. Course of action, yes. Uh, thanks for reminding me about how I'm supposed to finish the talk. <laughs> Perfect time. Okay, two minutes. I will go to the next question. All right, do the two minute elevator pitch. Four one. The reason we want the reason we are all scientists is because we want to understand how the natural world works. And the, the better we understand it, the higher our civilization rises. The better our technology gets, the more enlightened we become. So there's, there's a motivation for the science of censorship when the censorship is illicit. Because it, it, as I think everyone in the room would agree, it's holding us back. It's, it's, it's become absurd, the, the, the degree of it. So, from the science of censorship comes the technology of anti-censorship. And what are the tools? Well, I gave you a few. The idea that there's a, there's a machine-like quality to these, to these people's reaction. Not, not, not to say that these people are machines, but in, in these narrow areas, they do indeed act very much like machines. Reducible, we think, to a computer program that will pass the Turing test. We call it defenders of the faith. So there's, there's an impetus, a reason to do this, is to, to fight censorship. Um, one of the tools is the legal tool, which I mentioned again. One thing is peer review is hearsay. There's other legal tools, such as, in, in my fantasy, a class action lawsuit against the American Accreditation Board invalidating everyone's degree in the process. But that's my little fantasy. <laughs> but I do see there's a, a site, there's several sites called names like lawschoolfraud.com where law students are doing the same thing. They're, they're, they, they're saying they've been defrauded by their law professors, which is all true. Well, I didn't say that. It appears to be, <laughs> allegedly. <clears throat> So there's other people thinking along these lines as well, because we we reached uh, what uh, what uh, Demas uh, and and uh, Angela Besti I cited him in my paper call it the peak of the hysteroidal cycle, where, where the, the hysteria it goes through cycles. So what Strauss and Howe call the fourth turning, we're in the crisis phase of that. And you see this hysterical behavior, and, and we're we're in an extremum now, I think. And along with that, of course, censorship is reaching an extreme, which makes it even easier to study. We have a wealth of data out there and information and, and uh, test points to test and test questions to ask. And, and from that, we can develop, I think, a technology that's partly based in psychology, partly in, in legal theory, um, partly in public relations and marketing. Um, 
that can overcome these things in a lot of areas, partly just by laughing at them. The Soviet Union was brought down not by nuclear weapons, but by laughter, because it became so absurd. Oops, and I'm at zero. <laughs> Back, I'll leave you. Thank you.